yourself away so you can use me I give myself away oh God I give myself away so you can use me here I am here I stand Lord my life is in your hands Lord I'm longing to see your desires revealed in me I give myself away I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you. Darkness, my God, the 
miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are it is true that jesus is as close to us right now as the whisper of his name so i encourage you to do that to whisper his name in the space where you're seated give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you lord it's your
I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind. Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to the venue. It's so good to be in worship with all of you today. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Hope. I'm one of the pastors here, and we've got Bob in the room. You want to say good morning? Good morning. And, um, oh gosh, I think we have Ron online this morning. I'm sorry if I'm not remembering it, it's Sandy, but we are really grateful that you are in worship with us today. It is a special Sunday in the life of our church. It is All Saints Sunday. We will get to that in a little bit more detail in just a second. But if you are new with us, we are extra grateful that you are here. In fact, we'd love to be able to welcome you well. And we have a venue mug that we'd love to give to you. You can just text coffee to the number at the bottom of your screen, and we would love to get that to you. And then... If you are looking for opportunities to be able to connect more deeply into the life of our church family, we have a ton of things coming up that you can connect with us in. The first is actually this evening today at six o'clock, we have Taco About a Game Night, which will have tacos and a game night. It'll be super fun, uh, easy way to just come and hang out with us. You can come at six. If you would like to look online at the registrations or let us know you're coming, feumc.org slash taco23. And we also have a new members class coming up on Sunday, November 12th, which is next Sunday. So if you've been worshiping with us for a bit or want to meet other people who also are new here, then this is a great place to come and learn a little bit more about our church family. And we'd love the chance to get to know you a little bit more there too. FBUMC.org slash new members will get you to that registration. And we, it is so hard to believe that it is already November, so we have Thanksgiving that we are all preparing for. And one of our big traditions around here 
is helping with the Thanksgiving meal. And we've gotten so many donations already. We still are looking for desserts and rolls. So if you would like to be able to donate either of those things or volunteer day of for Thanksgiving, you can go to feumc.org slash Thanksgiving 23. And we just talked about Thanksgiving. Why not go ahead and talk about Christmas? We have our Christmas kickoff event coming up at the end of November. We'll have more info for that coming up, but we just wanted you to go ahead and get the date on your calendar to be able to save the date. That is gonna be on Sunday, November 26th from three until 5 p.m. And it'll be a super fun time where we all will have a chance to be together and to be able to prepare for Christmas. Uh, well, today is a really special Sunday, as I mentioned at the top in the life of our church family, because it is All Saints Sunday. And I realize for many of us that might not be a familiar term, but it's on this day every year where in the life of the church, we reflect on and give thanks for the communion of saints and we remember those who have died. Uh, we both celebrate the communion of saints in the church universal of everyone who has kind of gone before us in faith and we also celebrate particularly people that we have lost in the last year that have been a beloved to us. So today in the venue, after the sermon, we will be lifting up names of people that we have lost in the last year, and as well as people that over the course of time we continue to mourn. And I really would love to be able to lift up names of your loved ones as a part of the service this morning. So if you, kind of wherever you are worshiping with us, you can either text us or to the number, Bob, can we put that number back up at the bottom of the screen um, so they can text us? Perfect. And you can either text us the name of your loved one or you can, if you are worshiping with us on Facebook, which I know a lot of you worship other places, but if you are worshiping with us on Facebook, that's a great place to be able to put names in the comment section. And I will go ahead during the sermon, collect all of those names to be able to read them out as a part of our All Saints liturgy. So we'd love to be able to lift up people's names. And I know a lot of you kind of are doing other things as you were worshiping, whether you're eating breakfast or out on a morning walk or doing laundry or something like that. but. I would encourage you to take some time, particularly as we prepare and wrap up the sermon, to grab a candle and you that way you also can kind of participate in this All Saints liturgy with us from home as well. So I'm going to invite us at this time to kind of settle into worship as we begin with our opening song to kind of prepare our hearts to be able to worship our God this morning. Every breath that I am able, oh, 
the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So for the last few months, in a number of different ways, we've been inviting and challenging one another to step into, to have a real, meaningful, personal, worshipful encounter, experience, relationship with the one who made you and loves you. Uh, We've been reminded a few months ago that we were made in the image of God, and we spent some time inviting one another to worship with our whole selves. We've encouraged one another to pursue a vital faith, actively pursuing a relationship with God who's pursuing a relationship with us, one who knows us and wants to be known by us. These are the things that we have spent the last few months uh, talking about. Uh, But sometimes something gets in the way of being able to do that, right? Uh, There are hurdles or barriers or roadblocks or whatever you want to call them that prevent us from having like a real good, meaningful, authentic relationship with God. And we wanted to take some time here in November-ish Uh, to talk about those things. Um, Technically, today, we are going to be looking at two, uh, but really, we're just going to be talking about one of the biggest barriers uh, that I think maybe I'm not alone in struggling with, and that is shame. Uh, Technically, we're talking about guilt and shame, uh, which for me kind of always get lumped together, uh, though technically, I think that they are two different things. Maybe a rough and ready definition, if it's helpful, is that uh, guilt is like the negative emotion that we experience around something that we have done. Shame has more to do with who we are. So guilt says, I did a bad thing. Shame says, therefore, I am a bad person. And I am great at shame. I am an expert at it uh, and have been practicing most of my entire life. Um, It is hard for me to differentiate feeling like I failed without feeling like a failure, right? Uh, It's hard for me, like if I have a moment where I don't parent well, uh, I don't bring my best self to a moment that is highly stressful. Um, I am quick to say, I I am actually, I am a bad parent. Uh, I never call my family enough, um, particularly my parents. It's very easy for me to just call myself like a a bad son. Um, When I was a kid, if I didn't do well on a test, I'm a bad student. Um, Nowadays, if I can't run the same pace as I did as a teenager, I'm probably dying. So I might as well enjoy my last meal. It's a filet biscuit combo from Bojangles. So uh, months ago, months ago, um, when we started talking about this series uh, and kind of laying some of it out, uh, and we called the series, You Are Loved, I said, like, can we not do that? I don't want to do this. I think it's a bad idea. At the end of the day, I was convinced that it was the right idea, but I'm just going to say the only thing worse than struggling with your shame every single day of your life is spending 15 minutes talking about it with 1,200 of your closest friends and then making sure it's on YouTube for all of eternity because that doesn't seem like it's going to make shame any worse at all, ever. I've been very grateful in my uh, adult life. Uh, for the work of Brene Brown. If you don't know her, I'd encourage you to check it out. Look her up. Uh, she's got a lot of great like TED Talks, things like that online. Um, uh, I uh, came into an awareness of, uh, of her work probably about 10 years ago. She does evidence-based science work, science stuff. 
Um, but I, I love the way that she comes at it. Uh, she comes at it, I think, from a good place, like a place of faith. In fact, if I recall correctly, uh, one of the words that she uses a lot um, is uh, wholehearted, which she heard uh, during communion and worship one day. Um, and so she talks a lot about shame, a lot about vulnerability and authenticity. And uh, her, her work has been a great gift to me in my own journey of faith and in my life um, and relationships. Um, she says uh, at one point that shame is derived from this complex web of unattainable and conflicting expectations about who I am supposed to be. And when the real me doesn't line up with these expectations um, that we feel we experience, shame. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, I learned from her that has been uh, I sort of like immediately recognized as true and has been super helpful, she talks about like what we do, like what our response to feeling that disconnect is. Um, and when we feel shame, uh, we tend to try and cover that over. So we feel shame. We, we talk about like metaphorically, like we put on a mask or a, a false self. Um, we try to be the person that we think other people want us to be so that at the end of the day, we can be loved or accepted or belong to a person or to a group of people. And she says that um, the outcome of that is often worse than if we had been rejected for just showing up as our true selves. Because what happens is, People do tend to like the people we project ourselves to be. So we become loved. We start to belong. We are accepted by others. But we know in the back of our mind that they, what people are loving or accepting is actually a false version of ourselves. And then we say this thing in the back of our minds. And some people have ascribed like a name to, to their version of this self-talk. Uh, I guess mine's name's just Owen. But uh, we hear ourselves say, but if they knew the real me then I wouldn't be loved or accepted or belong. And that right there does a lot of stuff to us. It does a lot of stuff to us. It's like really harmful to our emotional self. Um, I think when I first heard her say it or read her say it uh, in the gifts of imperfection, like I could immediately recognize, I could see that at work in my own life. And, and I feel like I, even before I ran into her stuff, like I've been on this journey of like how to be a more fully authentic person. Um, and, but I could just, I could just, I could just see it. I could just see it. Um, when we experience that kind of reality, it tends to separate us from the people that we're trying to belong to. Like it creates gaps between us and the people that we love or who love us. Uh, and I also recognized pretty clearly uh, as a pastor at the time, like just how much that can also impact someone's ability to be in a, in a real vital relationship of faith uh, with God through Jesus Christ. Because like as much as we might be able to fake ourselves to people in our everyday, ordinary walking around lives, like we know God sees our true selves. Uh, and so um, like it's, it just makes us, like it's a, it's a barrier. It's a hurdle. Shame prevents us. Uh, it creates a lot of distance, prevents us from showing up authentically uh, before the one who, who made us. Um, I have learned I have learned kind of in the midst of my expert shameness uh, that how people talk to me when I'm in that place, like how people show up for me when I'm in a, in a place of shame is it like, this really matters. It really matters. Um, when I'm honest with people uh, that I'm experiencing shame in a particular moment, like when I allow myself to be vulnerable, the worst thing that people can do is to try and be encouraging. And when you say to someone like, I really feel like a failure right now, I really feel like a bad son, I really feel like a bad parent, automatically people will be like, no, 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 you're not a failure, you're a great dad, you're a wonderful son, I bet. Like people say things because they want to be helpful, they want to be encouraging. What I really just need people to do is to say like, oh gosh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> like I need them to let me own my own junk and then I need them to remind me that they're not actually going anywhere. That even if I show up as my true self, uh, that they're going to stick it out with me, right? One of the things that uh, Brene Brown says that, that may be helpful is um, she says that the antidote to shame is empathy. Um, uh, like, I know that too. Like, I know what that's like. I can imagine how that must feel. Uh, the power of people being able to say, yeah, like, I hear you. She says, me too. So this is back in 2012. But um, she says that even that small phrase, me too, has the power to interrupt the shame spiral 
that sometimes we get in, right? Like when um, I talk about like my shame meter is ticking up. Like if I were to say to someone, like, I really feel like a failure right now. And they're like, no, good stuff probably came out of that. Bloop, 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 bloop. Like I can feel my shame level rising, right? Uh, they say like, and I wasted so much time. I should have been spending that with my kids. No, your kids, they understand that you've got more important things to do than them. They're not going to hold that against you or talk about you later in therapy. Boo, 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 boo. Like I just, you know, feel it ratcheting all the way up over and over again. And, and honestly, one of the worst things that I feel like people can say to me when I'm in that moment, when I'm in one of those shame spirals, I say like, I can't be everything to everyone. I'm trying. I just can't meet all these expectations that everybody have for me. Well, God loves you in spite of all that. I mean, that just sets it off. Then I have to go for a run just to try to like get it all out, process it all out. And then I'm slow. So then I just bow size, whatever shame I've got. Like, it's just, it's not, it's not helpful. It's not helpful to me. Um, it makes me feel like I have to pretend that what I'm actually experiencing or dealing with is, is not legitimate or valid. Um, and, and it doesn't help. It doesn't help. I just need to know that people hear what I'm saying and they're going to stick, stick it out with me, uh, regardless of that. So uh, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you that God loves you while we're together today. Uh, instead, I would love to read you just one sentence of scripture. Uh, it comes from Genesis chapter three and it's verse 21. And it says this, and the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. That is a random passage of scripture to read, I know, but I want you to hear me out. It's interesting to me that here we find God making clothes for Adam and Eve because seven verses, the 14 verses in verse seven, 14 verses before this one, um, Adam and Eve make clothes for themselves and it is evidence of their shame. Uh, back in the good old days in the garden, um, there was no separation between God and human. There was no separation from human to human. Everyone showed up authentically with one another. And there was no separation between what was and what should be because everything was as it ought to be. Sometimes around here, we call that shalom or toviness, right? Um, but Adam and Eve had been given one rule by God and they broke that rule. Uh, and they started feeling guilt because of the thing that they had done. But they let that guilt sink down into that place that we called shame. When things were good, things were all together, it said that the man and woman were naked and they were not ashamed. As soon as they break that rule, it says that in verse 7 that their eyes were open and they recognized that they had something to cover up. And so they made themselves close so that they could present a better version of themselves to one another. And that created separation between Adam and Eve between spouses, right? And it creates separation between humanity and God. God comes strolling through the garden in the cool of the afternoon, calling out for Adam and Eve, and they are hiding behind the ficus, right? Um, they are, they don't want to be seen, right? It's created separation between them, separation between them and God, because what is and, and what should be are now also separated. And in that separation, we always find shame between like our aspirational self, like what ought to be and what really is. Like if they knew the real me, that's where shame always exists. And so we see Adam and Eve kind of get locked in the middle of that shame. Now, in between that passage and the passage that I read to you just a second ago, God sort of lays out what the consequences of their choices and decisions are. And you and I both know because we live in the real world that there are consequences to every choice and every decision that we make. Um, and they need to understand their consequences, right? Uh, and one of those consequences is that they can no longer stay in the garden where everything is held together, right? And even there, right, as soon as all those things are kind of laid out, in between learning what those consequences are and those consequences coming to be, uh, we see God in this like really kind of beautiful and tender moment show up for Adam and Eve and give them exactly what they need to move forward. Despite the brokenness, despite, despite the separation that now exists, we see God moving first towards Adam and Eve in the place of their shame. The clothes that God stitched together for them were evidence of God's mercy and God's grace. Even there, even then, God met them in their shame and gave them what they needed. It's not hard for me to hear this passage uh, or read this passage and hear echoes later in the New Testament in Galatians. It says that those who have been baptized into Christ have been 
clothed with Christ and are therefore a new creation. Everything that had been separated by the choices that we make gets, starts getting reunified and brought back together. We are all one in Christ Jesus, our Lord, it goes on to say. This idea that we will be clothed with Christ, I think, is a reflection of maybe just this exact sort of moment. Once, through the sacrifice of an animal, God provided us the clothes that we needed to live life outside the garden. And now, through a greater sacrifice, through the sacrifice of Jesus we are clothed in Christ, and that welcomes us back into that perfect relationship with God, undoing all the separations that shame has laid bare. When I read this passage about God stitching clothes together and giving them what they needed for life outside the garden, I see God showing up in the midst of their shame and saying, I'm going to be with you anyway. And I know that that's what I need. I need someone to sit with me while I wrestle in the pit of my shame spiral. I just need to know that they're going to hang with me. And I need to sit there in that place long enough to remember that God can and God does still love me. And it's not going anywhere. So today, in this moment, I'm not going to tell you that God loves you. What I am going to tell you is that this world, my world, is full of a lot of complex, unattainable, and often conflicting expectations that I cannot live into. I can't live into them when I try. I probably couldn't live into them even on my best days. And I wrestle with shame in my own way, not yours, but in my own way, and often poorly every single day of my life. And in spite of all that, I really do believe that God loves me. And that, that my shame doesn't need to create space between me and God, between me and the ones I love and those who love me, and that I don't have to get all my junk together as a prerequisite for God's love. Even when it's hard to hold on to, I know that I am a beloved child of God. And I'll be praying for you, hoping that one day, even if it's not now, you can say, me too. Amen. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Well, friends, we've now come to the time of our All Saints Liturgy. And this is a day that is not only a day for us to be able to kind of invoke the saints of the church. Um, or sorry, it is not a day for us to pray to saints or to invoke the saints of um, the church, nor for us to focus on the extraordinary achievements of particular Christians, but rather this is a day for us to celebrate the grace of Jesus Christ that is at work at God through ordinary people and ordinary moments in our lives. People that have experienced shame and guilt all like the rest of us, God finds us and meets us all in this place. So this morning we remember each and every person every time and every place and perfect and broken who have been made whole through Jesus Christ, that each of us are called to readily offer our gifts for the service and enrichment of the body of Christ. So today, as we celebrate All Saints Day, it's a chance for us to reflect on and give thanks for the gifts of those who have nurtured our faith, those who have invested in our life of faith, those who have now gone before us, finishing their course in faith, and for us, our great cloud of witnesses, a communion of saints. So we'll offer the names of those that we give thanks for today. And as I read the names, I'll light a candle and then Kyle is going to toll a bell. If you at home have a candle ready as we read the name of your loved one, if it's one that we are reading out, you're welcome to light a candle then. We also will have a time at the end where you're able to light a candle of your own as well. If, you're, if a name is not one that we are reading out today. After we've read the names, there'll be time um, for us to also name collective griefs that we all are holding on to. 
we'll have a time of prayer and space where you can feel free to be able to speak out loud or silently of the people who have been a part of your life in a meaningful kind of way that have gone on before you in this faith journey. That could be somebody, again, who's died in the last year. It could be someone who's died many years ago, and yet their witness continues to be significant in your own life. Our hope is that by remembering and celebrating the lives of those who have meant so much to us, that we might be reminded that all of us are beloved children of God. And God cares for each and every one of us so, so deeply. My friends, let us pray together. Oh God, you're the one who gave us birth and you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. So give to us now your grace that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die, so that when our days here are accomplished, we might be enabled to die as those who go forth to live, so that living or dying our life may be in you, that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from the great love of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, it is by faith that we lift these names to you, O Lord, giving thanks for your work um, in their lives and their work in ours. So let us pray together. Barbara Crutchfield. Cinda Brandt. Jesse Adams. Jean Fox. Frank Vaughn. Glenna Ergel. Dennis Salt. Mary Hornsby. Keith Strantman. Erlene Stevens. Steve Sparling, Taylor Anthony, Donna Davis, Alicia Jackson. Lynn Brantley. Now for names that have come in. Jerry Bullock.
other names that have come in. Harry and Connie. Mike Jackson. Troy Jackson. Jamie Van Vandenberg. Christopher Furtick. Bruce Rendell. Charles Jones. Michael Murray. Donald Collins IV. Bill Burley. Jim Taylor. And Angela Hinton. I light one additional candle for all of the lives tragically lost this year from ongoing wars in Israel and Palestine, in Ukraine, in Armenia, and the many lives lost due to violence closer to home. Friends, at this time, if there is a loved one whose name we have not read aloud that you would like to be able to honor today, I invite you to light a candle in your home, to speak their name out loud, to remember your loved one at this time. Let us pray together. Lord, for all the saints from whom their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confessed. Thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Alleluia, alleluia. O God, as we offer these names of the saints of the church to you, may the candles we have lit, the names we have shared, remind us all that the light of Christ shines through the darkness of grief, embracing our pain and heartache. O God, we ask that you would meet us in our grief today. Remind us that we can always find a home in you, O oh God, especially in the days when life's unthinkable fragility is too much to hold. We ask that you would draw near to us, O oh God. Lord, we offer all of our pain, all of our sorrow, all of our heartache to you knowing and trusting that you see us and you call us beloved. Amen. Friends, we're going to flip over in a posture continued of prayer to our closing song. And as we do so, I'd invite you to continue to remember the saints in your life that have gone before us in faith. i 
Friends, it's truly been a gift to be together in this worship service today. This is one of my favorite services that we get to do all year long, and particularly at the venue to be able to lift up additional names and know that in this season, particularly uh, those of you that are walking through a season of grief, know that we see you and we are with you. And if there's any way that we can be caring for you and walking alongside you in this season, we'd love to be able to, to do just that. If you are not already connected to us, then feel free to text coffee to the number at the bottom of your screen, and we'd be more than happy at any point to be able to journey with you. Uh, feel free to ask us any questions. We also can send a, a Venue Connect card your way so you can connect with us there. And it is the first Sunday of the month, so we are having communion in all of our worship services today as well. And we'd love to be able to celebrate communion with you. And so if you are close by and would like to come and have communion served to you, or if you'd like to, we can send a Stephen minister to you to be able to receive communion at your home, feel free to let us know. You can just call the church office. The number is at the bottom of your screen. And we'd be more than happy to find one way or another to be able to celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper with you wherever you might find yourself. And just a couple reminders as we head out that we do have tacos this evening at 6. And I would love to get to share a taco with you tonight. And we, my car is packed with lots of games. And I know a bunch of you also are bringing games. So it will sure to be a very fun night. So I would love to get to see you at 6 o'clock today. And as we head out from here, um, might the light of Christ shine in whatever darkness, whether that is guilt or shame you are carrying or even grief, might the light of Christ shine in those dark places such that you might always know that you are never alone, that our God is with you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Spirit, we invite you into this space. We invite you into the dark corners of our hearts so that you can bring a light that only you can bear. Oh, spirit and sound, 
of heaven pour your spirit out pour your spirit out oh yes oh yes pour your spirit out right here Lord for hearts that burn with holy To bear your light, lamp of flame, city bright, King and Kingdom, come is what we pray. Yeah, we need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven, pour your spirit out on us, pour your spirit out on us, a holy with your power. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the way sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to
I've never known a love like yours So intimate, so powerful And I've tasted, I've seen And nothing comes close I've never known a love like yours Jesus, your name is power it's breath and living water And your spirit guides me To the heart of the Father Let your praise ring louder Every day and every hour Cause your spirit guides me To the heart of the Father I've never felt at home like this Just like a child so innocent And I'm safe inside your arms Cause you won't let go I've never known a love like yours Jesus, your name Spirit guides me to the heart of the Father. We sing 
God, we sing praise. God, we sing praise. We sing praise. We sing praise. we hear a song of David, David who found himself in an ugly situation and yet turned to words of praise. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be in my mouth. I will praise the Lord. Let the suffering listen. Magnify the Lord with me. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free.
It was never God's purpose to abandon Jesus in that tomb, you see. His purpose was always to exalt Jesus, to exalt that name above every other name, so that the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Good morning. We are so excited to be here in worship with you. We invite you to stand as we sing. No matter how we've walked into this place this morning, we know that our God has already met us here. So let's praise. Louder in the valley, trusting that he's gonna get you there. Sometimes you've gotta welcome the wonder, wait for the answer. Worship with your hands in the air. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest he Well, good morning, friends. It's so good to be in worship with all of you today. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Hope, and it is so good to be together. Uh, just a couple of reminders. If you are new with us, we are so grateful that you are here. And in fact, we made some homemade sugar cookies for you. Those are at the welcome tent on your way out of worship. You can find them just past the fountain through the lobby doors. And for all of us, we have a Connect Serve card just in the chair pocket right in front of you. It's a great way to get on our email lists or ask us any questions that you might have, and you can just drop it in the offering boxes on your way out of worship. And a couple things that we thought might be helpful. We have started R3 Construction, which is our big capital campaign, so we have a little bit of some detours happening to get in and out of the building that we wanted to make sure you knew about for worship on a Sunday morning. If you are here right now, it means you probably get here on the earlier end. So we wanted to ask you in particular to help us be hospitable to folks particularly that are, are new or are visiting to be able to park in the side lots. So if you 
when you come to worship, if you actually can park in the gravel lot, you can see the on the picture here, it's kind of like in the back at the top. Uh, then we have a brand new kind of detour option to be able to get into the building since our typical backdoor entrance is not available right now. We will get you in right through this hallway. And I think Mr. Otis, yep, with his finger up right there, is one of our star ushers that is helping people find places to be able to sit and worship once you get through the hallway. So we have lots of signs that should help you out, but just know that it would be really helpful to be able to create space in our side parking lots for visitors and guests that are coming. So if you can park in the back gravel lot. If you are able to do that, then that would be super helpful over the next couple months. We also have a, a bunch of opportunities to be able to connect with us in the life of our church family. One is the new member class that is coming up on October, or sorry, ooh, we are in November now, November 12th uh, from 4 until 6 p.m. And you can register for that online, fbumc.org slash new members. And you might have recognized that our centrum looks a little bit different today, particularly our communion table. And that is because today is All Saints Sunday. And during the next song, Owen and I will be lighting candles to remember the people in the life of our congregation over the last year who have died. And we'd encourage you all to be kind of in a posture of prayer for all of those that have gone before us in faith as we continue singing this next song together. I walked into this space this morning, I found such strength in knowing that God's grace is sufficient for each of us, that there is no shame in the presence of our God. So let us worship that way this morning. I know you're I can see it in your eyes. So pull back the curtain, take off your disguise. Whoever told you it ain't worth a fight The cross tells a story that'll change your mind There's only the So come as you are 
that space of feeling like things just are so hard. I know that Christ's power is perfected in weakness. So as we sing together, let's lean in on that. Let's lay down the things that we've been carrying and speak to our God. breath that we are able, we will sing to you, Lord. Almighty God, we just come. We come in this spirit of knowing that we often hide behind the things, the shame, the guilt, the things that we are carrying, God. But we also know, God, that our ultimate comfort, our ultimate healing, our ultimate forgiveness comes from you. So God, allow us to release those things into your care. Allow us to release those worries, those stressors, those anxieties. Because God, we know that you are a God of abundant love. 
We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, if you slipped in after we had a chance to greet everyone, good morning to you. It's good to be uh, good to be together. If we hadn't met yet, my name is Owen. I'm one of the pastors here. A couple things before we dive in uh, to the sermon this morning. Uh, just these are opportunities for you to uh, connect with one another. Uh, coming up, we've got uh, tonight taco about a game night. Uh, so tacos and game night, hanging out here. Uh, if you haven't, let us know you're coming. It's not too late. Uh, you can do that this afternoon, fbumc.org slash taco23. Uh, we'd love to see you out. Uh, and then I'm going to give everybody a chance to take a deep breath because I'm about to talk about Thanksgiving and Christmas. <sighs> it's going to be okay. Um, so uh, on Thanksgiving, uh, we... Uh, make meals and then ship them out to folks in our community uh, that wouldn't otherwise ordinarily have a meal on Thanksgiving. And surprise, surprise, uh, all those volunteer slots are filled up, which is awesome. Um, however, we are still in need of some carbohydrates. So um, if you could make a dessert or rolls, if that's a thing that you would enjoy doing, uh, we would love, uh, love to invite you to participate in that way. And you can see the link there. Thanksgiving 23 should get you all the information you need. And then uh, the Sunday after Thanksgiving uh, is November the 26th, uh, and we're going to have our Christmas kickoff that afternoon from 3 until 5. Um, I think in the past it's been mostly stuff for just little kids, uh, but we've tried to make sure that there are opportunities for people of all ages, so we'd love to have everybody come out for that. Uh, it should be a good time again Christmas, November the 26th. So it begins. So it begins. Well, uh, for the last few months, um, we have been in like an ongoing conversation, and we have been inviting one another uh, to step into a deeper relationship, into a more meaningful, a more vital faith uh, with God. Uh, a number of months ago, we talked about how all of us are created in the image of God. Uh, we've talked about worshiping with our full selves, like bringing our authentic selves to worship. Uh, that we just finished a series uh, talking about how uh, the God that made us knows us and wants to be known by us, uh, inviting us into a vital relationship with one who is pursuing a relationship with us. So we've been sort of making this invitation over the course of the last few months, but one of the things that we've been realizing as we've gone uh, is that there are some hurdles and some barriers uh, that some of us share that prevent us from being able to do that uh, naturally or easily. And so uh, we wanted to take November-ish, uh, to, to sort of name some of those barriers. And today, uh, we're going to be talking about a big one. Uh, technically, it's two, guilt and shame. Uh, but for me, and I think maybe for many of us, uh, those two things end up getting lumped together. I'd like to separate them for just a second. Uh, a rough and ready definition for guilt uh, would be a negative emotion that we have around something that we have done Whereas shame is when we take that guilt and perceive it to say something about who we are. So guilt says, I did a bad thing. Shame says, therefore, I am a bad person. Uh, oftentimes, guilt leads to shame. And of that, I am an expert. Uh, I do it every day, and I've been doing it my whole life. Uh, I am very, very good at shame, so I'm super excited uh, to have been given this topic to preach on today, because what's worse than living with crippling shame every day of your life? Oh, I know, talking about it in front of a room full of people, <laughs> and then having it live on the internet for all of eternity. Hooray! Uh, so, um, failure is something that I often struggle with. I'm not saying that's something you struggle with, this is mine. Uh, and so, but oftentimes, instead of saying to myself, well, I failed, or this did not go as well as I had hoped, uh, I tend to internalize that as in, I am a failure, right? Or uh, in maybe one of my better uh, moments, I don't show up as my best full self, uh, particularly around bedtime, oftentimes with my kids. Uh, and so instead of just saying like, whew, I kind of missed the boat on parenting in that moment, I will say to myself, I am not a good parent. I'm a bad parent. I don't call uh, my mom and dad often enough, uh, certainly not my grandfather, just turned 99, by the way. Um, yeah, he said he wanted to hold back on the ideas for his birthday party uh, for next year so he can really blow it out. Uh, um, so if I don't do that, it's not just that I didn't quite get to that this week, it's that I'm a bad, I'm a bad son. I'm a bad son. When I was a kid, I remember if I didn't do well on a test, thinking it's because I'm a bad student. 
Um, nowadays, uh, I go out for a run. I'm trying to get back in shape. Uh, and when I don't run as fast as I was running in college, um, instead of just saying, like, gosh, I'm out of shape, I think to myself, I'm, I'm dying. Uh, and <laughs> I should probably just at least celebrate with one last filet biscuit combo. Um, it's just, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard for me, right? So a few months ago, when we started kind of putting all the sticky notes on the wall for the series we were coming up to, uh, someone suggested we do a series called I Am Loved. And I said, Bleh. Um, but I think it's good. I think it's good. Uh, and so here we, here we find ourselves together today. Um, uh, a person who has been really helpful for me uh, in my own work of dealing with shame in my own life is a, by, a person by the name of Brene Brown. Uh, if you don't know her, I would encourage you, if it's helpful, to go and check her out. She's got lots of great stuff on, uh, on the interwebs. Uh, and uh, in particular, she's got a lot of like TED Talky type of uh, dis, you know, sized things. Uh, and they just have been really, really helpful for me. So uh, you can find her pretty easily and take as deep a dive down that rabbit hole as you would like. Um, but one of the things uh, that I really love about her is she does science. Um, she's doing math uh, around uh, shame, uh, vulnerability, authenticity. Uh, but I think that she's coming at it from a place of faith, which is always uh, something that is important to me. Uh, in fact, one of the words that she used, I think it's the title of one of her books, Wholeheartedly, uh, she sort of stumbled upon that word, I believe, in the middle of communion liturgy uh, at her own, uh, in her own church. So um, I'm, I'm really grateful for her work. She said at one point that shame is derived, and I'm sort of paraphrasing her words here, shame is derived from a complex web of unattainable and often conflicting expectations about who I am supposed to be. Now, these could be expectations that others have of us, or expectations that we have of ourselves, or expectations that we perceive others to have about us. They are often unattainable, and they are often conflicting. They're not possible. And yet, we have these expectations about ourselves, and when we fail to meet those expectations, we carry that as shame. And this is really uh, completes, uh, creates some complexity in interpersonal relationships uh, because we're not people who like to experience shame generally in front of others. And so what we do is we try to cover that shame up. Uh, so if we want to be uh, loved or accepted or affirmed by another person and we feel like we are not a lovable enough person to be loved, affirmed, or accepted by another, uh, then we tend to try and create a version of ourself that would make us that way uh, to those people, right? So uh, sometimes we talk about this as wearing a mask. Sometimes we talk about it as putting on our false self. Um, and the, really the problem with that uh, is that it actually is very effective. Like it works very well, right? But when we become known or loved or accepted by someone, even once we've put on this like fake version of ourselves in order to be so, when it works, when it works, we hear ourselves say in the back of our head, some people have actually named this voice, Mine's name is just Owen, but uh, we, hear, we hear in the back of our heads, we hear ourselves say, but if they knew the real me, then they wouldn't. If they knew the real me, then all this would fall apart. And Brown says that that moment right there is worse for us than if we had shown up as our true authentic self and been rejected as a result of it. She said that this is the thing that is so hard. For, this is crippling, she says, right? When I heard her uh, talking about this uh, probably about 10 years ago at this point in time, as soon as I heard it, it was one of those things I said, yes, like this thing that she just said is true. I don't know if it's true for everybody, but I could see it in my own life. I knew it as soon as she said it. I could just name example after example after, and like a half a beat later, I said, is this why it is so hard for me to show up authentically in front of God? I recognize that this isn't just something that creates separation and distance from us in our interpersonal relationships, but this is one of those things that has the, the real tendency to separate us from our relationship with God. Because while we might be able to fake it really well in front of our colleagues on Monday morning, we know that there is no umbrella strong enough to prevent God from seeing our true selves. And so when we show up to God, we just show up in this place of shame. And that always creates separation, always creates, always creates distance. 
I have started trying to pay attention, uh, not just to like when I'm in a spiral of shame myself, but like how I, how I get there so I can kind of interrupt that cycle a little early on. Um, and I've, I've sort of learned that how people show up with me when I'm in a moment of vulnerability, when I'm sharing with them something that I'm struggling with, like it really, really matters. It really matters. I would say that most of the time, when I express some amount or some level of my shame, and it's never really all of it, it's just enough to test them out and see if they're cool with it. Um, but when I share a little bit of it with someone else, oftentimes people just want to make me feel better about myself. So the first thing that they say is, you know, I'm sure it's not that bad. You know, it's pro- that's, come on, that's not true. You're not a failure. Now, in that moment, I feel like I am, and you probably can't convince me otherwise. And oftentimes, the things that people say just make my, like, shame just, right, just sort of raise. So I'll say, like, uh, something went wrong. It didn't come out the way I wanted it to. Um, and someone will say, well, good stuff came out of it as well. Right? It just goes up. And I'll say, well, not only did I fail, but look at all the time that I wasted. Like, while this thing was not working the way it should have worked, I could have been hanging out with my kids. Therefore, I must be a terrible parent. And then they'll say, like, well, I'm sure they don't mind. They won't hold it against you. Right? Just shame a meter just keeps going up. Uh, and then I say, like, I can't be everything to everyone. Now I'm, like, really starting to spiral out. And then people will say this, God loves you anyway. <laughs> You know, like, now we're in, like, full-fledged spiral mode. And then I'm like, i got to process this out. i got to go for a run or something. So I go for a run, and then I'm very slow. Then it's just, I both size my shame after that. It's just a whole thing. It's just a repeated, it's a repeated process. Brown says that the antidote to shame is empathy. This is back in 2012. She said the two words, me too. She said those words have more power to interrupt someone's spiral of shame than anything else. Uh, and people don't always say it that way to me, but I gosh, she is right. Like, when people hear me in that moment and they say, you know what, that sounds, ter- that sounds terrible. Now, if they say like, well, you are a failure, that doesn't always help. But like, if people say like, I know what that's like, I know what that's like, gah, yeah. They just let me have it. Just let me have it for a second. Let me own that. And then remind me that you're not going anywhere. That's what I need. That's what I need in those moments. And over the course of my life, I've come to believe that this is exactly how God chooses to show up to me, and I believe to all of us, when we find ourselves in these moments. I'm not going to tell you this morning if this is something that you wrestle with on your own. I'm not going to tell you this morning that God loves you anyway. Uh, even if it's true. Uh, What I am going to do uh, is read you just one sentence from the Bible that I think underscores this from the very beginning. We're in Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 21. I'll come back to the context in a sec. It says, And the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. And clothed them. Here's what's so interesting to me about uh, this passage, is that 14 verses before this, in verse 7, uh, we see Adam and Eve, the man and the woman, make clothes for themselves. And in verse 7, those clothes are a sign of their shame. All right, so in the beginning, when God created the world, God didn't just create the world to look a particular way, but God created the world to work together in a particular way. And in that moment, what was... And what should be were the same thing, because everything was as it ought to be. Everything was held together. Man and woman held together. It says that they were naked and not ashamed. They were fully vulnerable in front of one, of, in front of one another, and they were unashamed, right? But God gave them one rule. Do not eat the fruit off of that tree, and we see that they did. They did. They broke that rule. And instead of just having guilt, I've done a bad thing, they allowed that guilt to spiral out into a place of shame. How do we know that? Because in verse 7, it says that their eyes were open. Their eyes were open. All of a sudden, they realized that what was and what should be were no longer the same thing. 
right? Things were no longer as they ought to be. Now there's a distance. And anytime we see a dis- distance between what is and what should be, um, we, experience, we experience shame. It says their eyes were open and immediately they hid themselves from each other. They took foliage that they could find and they built garments for themselves, right? To, to hide themselves from one another. So we see not just a separation of what is and what should be. We see a separation between spouse and spouse. And then it says that God came walking through the garden in the cool of the evening, calling out to Adam and Eve, where are you? And they're hiding behind a ficus and a fiddly fig, right? There's now distance, not just between spouse and spouse, but between human and God. Everything has been separated because of this shame that's carried. There's uh, then right after that verse, uh, there's a, a song or a poem that kind of lays out the consequences of the choices that they've made. And we're all, you know, adults. Um, we understand that there are consequences to the choices that we make in life, and we have to bear the results of those consequences, the choices that we've made, right? So we see those consequences laid out. One of those consequences is that Adam and Eve can no longer stay in the garden. When we get to the end of that poem, there are two verses. There are two verses uh, between the announcement of those consequences and the actualization of those consequences. In the first verse, we see Adam and Eve come back together with one another. And then in verse 21, it says that the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and his wife and clothed them. We see God moving towards human. When human moves away from God, God moves towards humanity. We see God show up. And in the midst of their shame, we see God give them exactly what they need. Exactly what they need. This is, in a sense, God's way of showing up and saying, I'm not going anywhere. Over and over and over again, I feel like God has shown up with me and said the exact same thing. There is, in this moment, I think, a tenderness and a beauty And a reminder that God is going to move towards us. It's always the first mover. Even there, even then, is going to meet us in our shame and give us what we need. It's hard for me to not hear in this passage uh, an echo later in the New Testament when we read in Galatians that anyone who is baptized into Christ is clothed in Christ and is therefore a new creation. Seen and known and loved by God who has been moving towards us, meeting us in our shame, giving us what we need since the very beginning. Once through the sacrifice of an animal to provide us the clothes we needed for life outside of the garden, and now through a greater sacrifice, clothing us in what welcomes us back in, undoing all the separations that shame lays bare in our lives. So this morning I'm not going to tell you that God loves you, despite my desire to do that. I am going to tell you that my world is full of a lot of complex, unattainable, and often conflicting expectations that I do not and cannot live into. I wrestle with my shame in my way, often poorly, and in spite of that all, I really do, I have come to believe that God loves me, that I don't need to create space between me and God, that my shame doesn't create space between me and God, and that I don't have to get all of my junk together first as a prerequisite to God's love for me. And even in moments and on days when that's hard to hold on to, I believe that I am a beloved child of God, and I will be praying for you hoping that one day, even if that day is not today, you'll be able to say, me too. We turn now uh, towards um, the table that is before us, not just to celebrate communion with one another. Um, Communion, of course, is a reminder over and over again that God shows up for us, moves towards us first. Uh, But we also show up to celebrate the lives of the saints, those who have gone on before us in their faith. I think In other traditions, uh, saints are perfect people, um, and we can sort of call upon them to help uh, with struggles that we're dealing with in our own lives. Uh, When we say saint this morning, that's not exactly uh, what we mean by that. Uh, we We are celebrating the grace of Jesus Christ and the work of God through ordinary people 
in ordinary moments of their lives. Uh, people who undoubtedly uh, carried shame and guilt and found, found moments uh, in their life where they felt like they were perhaps unlovable, and yet God continues to show up for them. In every time and every place, imperfect and broken people who have been made whole through Jesus Christ, who are called to offer their gifts readily and cheerfully for and in the service and enrichment of the body of Christ. And so today, as we celebrate All Saints Day, it's a chance for us to reflect on and to be grateful for the gifts of those who have nurtured our faith, who have invested their lives in our life, those who have now gone on before us and finished their course in faith, and who have become for us a great cloud of witnesses, a communion of saints. We will offer the names of those that we give thanks for today uh, in two groups. Uh, the first reading that uh, we'll have in just a moment here will include those in our church family who have died in the past year. As we read their names, if you shared some relationship with them, uh, we would invite you to stand where you are just as a way of honoring that relationship, their gift to you. And then uh, as we enter into communion together, uh, we will continue with a time of prayer and we will name that we are surrounded by those who feast at the table of our Lord that great cloud of witnesses, and we'll offer there a time for you to silently or out loud name someone who's been a meaningful part of your life and your faith journey. This could be someone who's died in the past year or any number of years before that. Our hope ultimately this morning is that by remembering and celebrating the lives of those who have meant so much to us, we might remember just how much each and every one of us is beloved by our God. Friends, let's pray together. O oh God, who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask, and our ignorance in asking. Give to us now your grace that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die so that when our days here are accomplished, we might be enabled to die as those who go forth to live, so that in living or dying, our life may be in you, and that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from your great love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. As we lift these names, again, I'd invite you to stand if you shared in relationship with one of these persons as a way to honor and remember them. Barbara Crutchfield. Cinda Brandt. Jesse Adams. Jean Fox. Frank Vaughn. Glenna Ergel. Dennis Salt. Mary Hornsby. Keith Strantman. Erlene Stevens. Steve Sparling. Taylor Anthony. Donna Davis. Alicia Jackson. Lynn Brantley. Fest.
Thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Alleluia, alleluia, amen. O God, as we offer these names of the saints and the church to you, may the candles we have lit and the names we have shared remind us of all the light of Christ that shines through the darkness of our grief, embracing our pain and heartache. O God, we ask that you would meet us in our grief today, remind us that we can always find home in you, especially in the days when life's unthinkably unthinkable fragility is too much to hold on to. Draw near to us, O God. Friends, we continue now in a posture of prayer, joining the saints through the generations as we pray together the prayer of thanksgiving. May the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors put their trust in you, our God. By faith, our grandparents cultivated our faith. By faith, our parents pruned and tended our faith. By faith, our friends and mentors journey with us in our faith. And so by faith, we lift these names to you, O Lord, giving thanks for your work in their lives and your work in ours. We begin by naming both Bill Burley and Angela Hinton, who have joined the communion of saints in the last month. We light an additional candle of all of the lives that have been tragically lost this past year from ongoing wars in Israel and Palestine, Ukraine and Armenia, and the many lives this year lost closer to home due to violence. I invite you now, if there are names that you are carrying with you this morning, saints that have been important to your life, either, either that you have lost over the last year or even across many years, um, to either silently or loud lift their names as we continue praying together. God, as we consider all of the saints that have been important to each and every one of us, we remember that as we come around this table, we come surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, with your people on earth and with all the company of heaven. So together with all of them, we praise your name and we join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he gathered around a table with his friends. He took ordinary bread and broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. My own flesh and blood do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and he gave it to all of them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant that is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we too offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. So let us proclaim together the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. I invite you to open your hands in a posture of receiving as we continue to pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. 
Renew our communion with all your saints, especially those whom we have named before you. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, strengthen us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. God, by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at last at your heavenly banquet, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, both now and forever. Amen. Let us continue praying together the prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And go ahead and invite our communion servers to come forward. And as they do, just a couple notes of instruction, particularly if you are new to having communion with us. Uh, when you come forward, you will come at the invitation of the ushers, and all are welcome to come and receive at this table. And at the first station, we will have bread, and we'll rip off a piece of bread with the words, this is the body of Christ given for you. And then at the next station, you'll be able to dip that bread into a cup of grape juice and receive both elements at the same time. And as you come, if you would prefer either gluten-free or prepackaged communion, then feel free to tell the person that has uh, the basket on their arm, the bread person, that you'd like to receive either gluten-free or prepackaged, and we'd be happy to serve you in that way. We also have gluten-free with an ingredient card in the back. If you would like to receive communion back there, you're welcome to slide out. And then as the communion servers, or as the ushers come forward, if you would like to remain in your seat, obviously you are welcome to do so. If you would like to receive communion in your seat, though, do let them know, and we'd be more than happy to bring communion to you. Friends, this is the table of our Lord, a table where each and every one of us are invited no matter what guilt or shame we might be carrying that keeps us from God or keeps us from being able to fully trust and believe that we are a beloved child of God, um, all are welcome at this table. Let us come and feast together.
Friends, what a gift it's been to be together in worship today. As we head out from here, might we go knowing that in the midst of our guilt, in the midst of our shame, that we find a God who is not going anywhere, that will be with us day after day, no matter what it is that we are carrying. May you go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as beloved children of God. Amen. Go in peace. We'll see you next week. Yeah.
Well, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Well, thank you for welcoming us into worship so well this morning. Uh, Welcome to all of you as well, if we've not had a chance to meet yet. Uh, My name is Owen. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're super glad to be in worship together with you this morning. If this is your first time with us, your first time in a long time, uh, we're really glad you're here. Uh, And uh, there's a Connect Serve card that's in front of the seat backs in front of you, uh, as well as a goodie bag that's under the welcome tent uh, just outside the front doors there on the other side of the fountain, and we'd love a chance Uh, to connect with you before you have a chance to slide out later on and to see if uh, you're ready to have a chance to get you connected with each other. A couple of things for uh, the good of our community together uh, this morning. The first is uh, we've started our R3 construction that is taking place all around the building, uh, but in particular for this point uh, on the adult wing, the back door, which is what enables folks to come from the back parking lot, um, the party lot as it is called, business in the front party in the back, um, to come in. Uh, So we have created a detour door that's in effect going to bring you in uh, the back door of the building right by the chapel uh, and then through this door into the centrum right here. And our ushers have been good about trying to help us figure out how to make that as hospitable as we can. Uh, I would like to ask you if you are a person who is able to walk easily um, to consider what it would look like parking in the gravel lot Um, with the limited entrances coming in. uh, We've just noticed that some of the um, some of the easy parking spaces have been taken up, and so just as an act of hospitality, um, if, you can, if you can navigate gravel, uh, if you can help us, and then you can use that door as a quick way uh, to come in. Um, secondly, uh, I would say we got a couple of things coming up uh, that will help us get connected together. Uh, the first is Taco About a Game Night is happening tonight, and uh, that's from at 6 o'clock tonight if you uh, would like to play uh, games or eat tacos or both at the same time. I don't know how you hold cards and eat a taco, but we'll work on that one. Uh, But lots of stuff happening tonight. We'd love to have you out for that. Uh, And then we have, uh, deep breath everyone, Thanksgiving and Christmas announcements. Um, Our Thanksgiving meal, uh, which we've been doing for many years, is taking place again this year. We'll be serving uh, food to those in our community who would not otherwise have a Thanksgiving meal on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, We have all of the volunteer slots pretty much are filled up for that day, uh, for the act of serving, but we are a little short on some carbohydrates. So if you uh, like to make desserts or if you like to make dinner rolls uh, or know someone who does, uh, you can go to Thanksgiving slash slash Thanksgiving 23 uh, to find more information about that. Uh, And then our Christmas kickoff will be the uh, Sunday right after Thanksgiving on the 26th from 3 until 5. Uh, And in the past, that's been mostly uh, for younger children or families with younger children. Uh, But we've really tried to broaden it this year so that anyone who comes uh, can feel like there's a place for them. And so kids of all ages, uh, as it were, um, we'd love to have you out for that. And then finally, we've got a new members class coming up on November the 12th. Uh, So if you've been worshiping with us for a while and you're ready to make it uh, Facebook official or to see what that's like, uh, we'd love to have you come and join us Uh, next Sunday from 4 until 6. Today in the life of the church is All Saints Sunday. Uh, It is a chance for us to remember those who have finished their course in faith, have gone on before us, uh, and who uh, continue to pray with Jesus for us, the church uh, triumphant, we say. Um, And so uh, as we enter into worship in just a moment with our opening hymn, uh, families of those that we've lost in the past year who are part of our church will have an opportunity to come and to light a candle um, as we celebrate their lives. And then a little later in worship, um, as we gather around the communion table, we'll have a chance to celebrate fully together the lives of those who have shaped and formed our faith. Uh, But for now, I would invite you to stand where you are as you are able as we join together in our call to worship. May the love of God enfold us. May the power of God set us free. Glory to God.
where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. 
Friends, let us pray. God of the ages, we praise you for all your servants who have done justice, loved mercy, and walked humbly with their God. We praise you for all who have sought your new creation and who, by their steadfast faith, have shown their discipleship in Christ Jesus. We praise you for those we have known and loved. We pray that we, with them, may follow in the way of Christ and at the last dwell in your holy city, sharing the inheritance of the saints and light through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My name is Julie Brown. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians chapter 13, verses 12 and 13. For now, we only see a reflection, as in a mirror. But then, we will see face to face. Now, I know only in part. Then, I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, Faith, hope, and love remain, these three. And the greatest of these is love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, for the last uh, few months, we've been uh, kind of along a consistent conversation. Um, uh, We've been, in different ways, inviting one another to uh, step into a deeper, more meaningful experience relationship uh, with God. Uh, We, a couple of months ago, were reminded that we have been made in the image of God by the one who made us. Uh, We've been invited in worship to do so with our whole selves, to bring our full and authentic self to worship. Uh, And we just finished a sermon series. Uh, We talked about how the God who made us knows us and wants to be known by us. Um, But sometimes there are things that get in the way of being able to own those promises fully. And uh, we decided that we needed to take some time here in November-ish to deal with some of those barriers or hurdles or roadblocks or whatever you'd like to call them. And so today... We're going to be looking at uh, two of those um, that we call guilt and shame. Uh, Now, for me, uh, those are basically the same thing. They're not. uh, I treat them the same way. Uh, I thought a rough and ready definition might be helpful for us this morning. So uh, guilt is the negative emotion that we experience around something that we have done. Shame is when we take that guilt and perceive that it is something that we are. So guilt says, I did a bad thing. Shame says, therefore, I am a bad person. You hear the difference? Um, Oftentimes, at least in my experience, guilt finds a way of spiraling itself into shame. And of that, I am an expert. Uh, In fact, I'm so good at it that um, a couple of months ago, when we were uh, sort of putting together our sermon series, and someone suggested that we should do a series called I Am Loved, uh, I said, because, uh, you know, what's worse than having crippling shame every day of your life? 
but getting up and talking about it in a room full of people and then letting it live on the internet for all of eternity. You know, nothing to worry about there. Um, but this is something that I deal with. I don't know if it's something that you deal with or not. Um, for me, uh, oftentimes my shame comes around failure. So when something doesn't go as I had hoped that it would go, instead of just saying, oh, I failed or this didn't work out, uh, I kind of take that on uh, and say, you know, I am a failure. Uh, if there's a moment where I don't show up as my best self uh, in a parenting situation, instead of just saying like, oh gosh, that did not go as well as I'd hoped, uh, I think to myself, I, I am a bad parent. Uh, I don't call my mom or my dad or my grandfather who just celebrated his 99th birthday a few weeks ago. Uh, I don't call them. Yeah, yeah. He said, don't do it big though. We got to save that for next year. Way to go, Papa. Um, uh, instead of just saying like, oh gosh, I should call them more often, I think to myself, I'm a bad son, right? When I was uh, growing up, if I didn't do well on a test, I would feel like I'm a bad student. Uh, nowadays, I'm trying to get back in shape, been out of shape for a little while, and when I can't run at the same speed as I was running when I was in college, uh, I think to myself, I am dying. Uh, <laughs> and then I think, well, for my last meal, I'll have a filet biscuit combo. Uh, if you're going to go out, at least go out on top. Uh, and this, for me at least, is how shame works, right? Uh, and again, I'm not saying that this is how it works for you, uh, but I am saying that this is how it works for me. Um, I stumbled upon the work of a woman named Brene Brown. I don't know if you know that name. If you do, great. Yeah, one fan back there. Uh, if, you, if you don't, I would really encourage you to, to, to check her out. Um, she, uh, she does science, right? Um, she does like qualitative and quantitative research around uh, shame and vulnerability. Um, her work has just been really, really important in my life, uh, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, particularly, I'm grateful for the ways in which, while she's doing science, uh, she's coming at it from a heart of faith. Uh, one of the titles of her books, one of her books uh, is called uh, Wholehearted, or she talks about living wholeheartedly. Uh, and that's a name that came to her one day when she was worshiping, and she heard, uh, she heard that word in her communion liturgy where she was worshiping. So um, uh, she says, she says that uh, shame is derived, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this here, shame is derived from the complex web of unattainable and conflicting expectations about who I am supposed to be. Now, this could be expectations that others put on us. These could be expectations that we put on ourselves. These could be expectations that we assume other people are putting on us. But shame comes from this complex web of unattainable and conflicting expectations about who we are supposed to be. And that can be particularly challenging in our interpersonal relationships with one another. It can create a lot of distance between us. Um, about 10 years ago, when I sort of first picked up her work, uh, she was talking about how when we experience shame, right, uh, that we immediately try to cover that up when we're dealing with other people. Uh, because in order for us to feel like we can be accepted or loved, um, or just sort of it belong to a group of people, uh, we feel like if we can't live up to that, we got to do something to hide that fact. we got to hide our shame. And so sometimes, she says, we talk about this as a mask that we wear, or we put on like a false sense of ourselves. We, we fake a little bit of who we are in order to get along with other people so that we can be loved or known or accepted by them. Uh, but she says that that's actually the most dangerous thing that we can do. Because even when we are loved and accepted and belong with a group of people, uh, in the back of our head, we have a voice. And some people I've heard, like, name the voice. Uh, they give a name to the voice in the back of their head. Mine's name apparently is just Owen. Um, but we hear in the back of our mind, we hear ourselves say, but if they knew the real me, if they knew the real me, then they wouldn't love me, they wouldn't accept me, and I wouldn't belong. And she says that that is worse than if we had shown up as our full, true, authentic self and been rejected as a result of it. She says that this is just, it's so hard, we carry it in such complicated and complex emotional ways. Um, as soon as I read that, I thought, oh, I, I know that. I know that. I could see in my own life, I had experiences that I could name, I knew people that I tended to fake it with a little bit more than others. I knew what it was like to hear that voice in the back of my head say, yeah, but if they really, really knew, then it would be different. This is, this is an experience that I knew immediately um, as I read it. About a half a beat later, I thought to myself, this, this is why it's so hard 
sometimes to have a relationship with God. Because while I might be able to fake it for my colleagues, I know I can't fake it in front of my Creator. If I know that God knows the real me, then that barrier of shame is just so much higher. And it sits there and prevents me from wanting to show up as my full and authentic self uh, in front of God. Owning that um, was beautifully helpful uh, for me. And so I started a journey of paying attention to what sort of sets off this spiral of shame that I find myself uh, getting in. And one of the things that I've noticed is like how people show up for me when I have a moment of authenticity or vulnerability and let them know what I'm wrestling with. Like how people respond to me in those moments um, it can make a huge difference. Uh, and if I can catch it early enough, uh, maybe it won't become a full uh, s- spiral of shame, right? Uh, but I've noticed that sometimes the way people respond to me, they actually make it worse. I think they're trying to be kind and encouraging. I'm a, I'm a fairly positive person in general. And so when I might say something like, oh, gosh, I just really feel like I messed up today. I feel like a, you know, just a failure. Just nothing's working the way it should. Like people will often try to offer encouraging words. And a lot of times those encouraging words just make my shame like, you know, just sort of go up. Uh, so I'll say, you know, as an example, gosh, I feel like I failed. That just didn't really go at all like I had anticipated. And, and someone will say, well, you know, good stuff came out of it too. And then I'll say to myself, well, gosh, you know, uh, I shouldn't have spent so much time and energy. If it was going to go so poorly, like think about all the other ways that I could have spent that time. I, I did not, I was like, I just did not spend, I should have been spending time with my kids instead of doing this thing. And they're like, oh, don't worry. They understand. They probably won't hold it against you when they're in therapy later. Right? Uh, and then I think, well, gosh, th- you know, this is probably is just me. Like, maybe this is just me. Um, you know, I just, I, I just, I'm so hard on myself. And I'm just like, there's so many expectations that are on me. I can't be everything to everyone. I'm just, gosh, it's just, I keep getting in my own way. And then invariably someone will say, well, you know, God loves you anyway. <laughs> like, there we go. Now we're in a full, like full on moment of shame. And then I got to feel like how to process that anxiety out. I'm like, I got to go for a run or something. So I go for a run and then it's very slow. And then my shame gets both sized. I, it just happens over and over and over again for me. But some people show up and they don't try to tell me that how I'm feeling is untrue. And they don't try to offer me words to just encourage me along. They show up and they say, well, gosh, that feels like it might be true to you. <laughs> but I just need you to know, you know, I'm not going anywhere. And nobody says it exactly like that, right? Uh, Brown says that the antidote to shame is uh, empathy. She says, this was like back in 2012, she said, the, the simple words, me too, have so much power to interrupt that spiral of shame. Just reminding people that you're with them, that you understand uh, what it is that they might be going through, and that you're not, you're not going anywhere. And if I'm real honest, if I'm real honest on my better days, um, I believe that that's how God shows up for me that that's how God has been showing up for me. And even when I find myself in a spiral of shame, to remember that in times before when I have, God hasn't failed me yet, reminds me, reminds me that I am a beloved child of God. Hearing that from someone else might not be helpful, but sitting in the midst of it, uh, when I can remember those things, it helps me through. So I'm not going to tell you this morning that God loves you. Uh, It might be true, uh, but I'm not going to say it out loud. Instead, I'd like to read you just one sentence uh, from Scripture, and it's going to seem like a bit of an odd one to begin with, uh, but hang with me for for a second. In Genesis uh, chapter 3, so we're like early, early on in the beginning, uh, in verse 21, it says, And the Lord God made garments of skins, animal skins, for the man and his wife, and clothed them and clothed him. Now, here's why I find this passage so remarkable. Here we see God making clothes for humankind, for human. Fourteen verses earlier, the man and the woman make clothes for themselves, and it is evidence of their shame. 
You see, in the beginning, when God made all things, God didn't make things just to look a particular way, but God made all things to work together in a particular way. And in the beginning, uh, the things that were, were the same as things as they should be, because everything was as it ought to be. You with me? And in this state of being, it says that the man and the woman were naked. They were fully vulnerable in front of one another. The man and the woman were naked, and they were not ashamed. But God gave them a rule. God said, don't eat the fruit off of that tree. And the one rule that God gave them, they broke. And instead of allowing that to be a a thing of guilt, I did a bad thing, that thing spiraled into a place of shame. And so in verse 7, we see the man and the woman, it says that their eyes were opened and they clothed themselves with whatever foliage they could find. Because in that moment, there all of a sudden was a difference between things as they were and things as they should be. And shame always exists where there's a gap between those two things. And when there was that separation, they recognized that they had something that they needed to cover up, right? In the same way that we might wear a mask or put on our fake self, they put on a fig leaf. And all of a sudden, there was separation between spouse and spouse. And then it says that God came walking through the garden in the cool of the afternoon, calling for Adam and Eve, but could not find them because they were hiding behind a ficus. It created separation between human and God. Shame always creates separation. Then, in the passages that follow, verse 7, uh, there's a poem or a song that lays out the consequences of the choices that they've made. We all know in the real world there are consequences to the choices that we make, and they we're told what the consequences of the choices that they made would be. And one of those consequences was that they could no longer stay in the garden. They had to go out and fend for themselves. And in between the announcement of that consequence and the actualization of it, there are these two verses, 20 and 21. In verse 20, we see spouse and spouse reunited. And in verse 21... It says, And the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and his wife and clothed them. In that moment, we see this beautifully tender moment of uh, uh, when God sort of, despite the brokenness that exists, despite the separation that they caused, we see God moving towards humanity and giving us exactly what we needed to move forward. These clothes were evidence of God's mercy and God's grace. Even there, even then, God met them in the midst of their shame and gave them what they needed. It's hard not to hear this passage echoed later in the New Testament in Galatians. It says that anyone who has been baptized into Christ is clothed in Christ. They are a new creation seen and known and loved by God who has been moving towards us since the very beginning, meeting us in our shame and giving us once we, what we needed, once through the sacrifice of an animal to provide us the clothes that we needed for life outside the garden, and then later, through a greater sacrifice, clothing that welcomes us back in, undoing all the separations that shame has the power to lay bare. That's what I see when God gives them clothes. Yes, that happened. No, that was not good. But I'm not going anywhere. And from that moment forward, I believe that's exactly how God operates with each and every one of us. And so this morning, I'm not going to tell you that God loves you. I am going to tell you that my world is full of a lot of complex unattainable, and often conflicting expectations that I can't and don't live into. I wrestle with my own shame in my own way and often poorly. And in spite of it all, I really do believe that God loves me. 
that that shame doesn't need to create space between me and God, that I don't have to get all of my junk together first as a prerequisite to the grace of God. And even when that's hard for me to hold on to, I know that I am a beloved child of God. And so if you find yourself as a, in a similar place to me, uh, please know that I am praying for you and will be praying for you, hoping that one day, even if today is not that day, that you can say, me too. Amen. Well, as we turn uh, our attention now to the communion table, as we continue to remember uh, all the saints of the church, uh, and particularly those um, that we are preparing to name here, uh, we recognize uh, that All Saints Day today is not a day for us to uh, pray for, pray to, or invoke the saints of the church, nor is it a day for us to focus on the extraordinary achievements of particular Christians. Rather, it's a day for us to celebrate people just like you and me, uh, who find themselves in all sorts of shame spirals on all sorts of days. And yet, even for those folks, we celebrate the grace of Jesus Christ who has been at work in the midst of it through the ordinary people in ordinary moments of their lives. In every time and in every place, imperfect and broken people who have been made whole by the grace of Jesus Christ have been called to offer their gifts readily and cheerfully for and to the service and enrichment of the body of Christ. As we celebrate all saints today, it's a chance for us to reflect on and to be grateful for the gifts of those who have nurtured our faith, who have invested their lives in our life, those who have now gone on before us finishing their course in faith and are for us a great cloud of witnesses, a communion of saints. We will offer uh, the names of those that we give thanks for today in two groups. Uh, the first is, uh, we will read in just a moment, the lives of those in our church that we have lost in the course of the past year. Uh, as we read their names, if you shared some part of their life with them just to, as a way to, uh, to honor their gift to you, we would invite you simply to stand where you are. And then in a moment uh, during communion, uh, we, as we are continuing in a time of prayer, uh, we will gather around the table surrounded by those who feast at the same table of our Lord with us, that great cloud of witnesses, and we'll offer a time there for you to share aloud or silently uh, any additional names, names of those who have been a meaningful part of your life or your faith journey. Uh, that could be someone who died in the past year. It could also be uh, someone that, you know, you lost long ago. And our hope is that by remembering and celebrating the lives of those who have meant so much to us, we might remember just how much each and every one of us is beloved by our God. Friends, let us pray together. O oh God, who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. So give to us now your grace that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and of death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die, so that when our days here are accomplished, we might be enabled to die as those who go forth to live, so that living or dying, our life may be in you, and that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from your great love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to lift up the names of these saints, I'd remind you that you are welcome to stand if you stood in relationship with each of them as their names are read. Barbara Crutchfield. Cinda Brandt. Jesse Adams. Jean Fox. Frank Vaughn.
Lena Urkel. <laughs> that she was. Dennis Salt. Mary Hornsby. <laughs> Keith Strantman. Erlene Stevens. Steve Sparling. Taylor Anthony. Donna Davis. Alicia Jackson. Lynn Brantley. For all the saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confessed, thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Alleluia, alleluia, amen. O God, as we offer these names of the saints of the church to you, may the candles we have lit and the names that we have shared remind us that the light of Christ shines through the darkness of our grief, embracing our pain and heartache. God, we ask that you would meet us in our grief today. Remind us that we can always find home in you, O God especially in the days when life's unthinkable fragility is just too much to hold. Draw us near to you, O oh God. As we continue now in a posture of prayer, joining the saints through the generations as we pray together this prayer of thanksgiving. May the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors put their trust in you, O oh God. By faith our grandparents cultivated our lives of faith. By faith our parents pruned and tended our faith. By faith, our friends and mentors journeyed with us in our faith. And so it is by faith that we lift these names to you, O Lord, giving thanks for their work, for your work in their lives and their work in ours. We begin today by also naming Jim Taylor, Bill Burley, and Angela Hinton, whose lives have been lost and who joined the communion of saints recently. We light an additional candle today for all of the lives tragically lost this year in ongoing wars in Israel and Palestine, in Ukraine and Armenia, and many lives lost due to violence closer to home. Friends, I invite you now to either silently or aloud also lift the names of saints that you are carrying with you today people that have been meaningful, whether you've lost them over the last year or the last course of many years that continue to be important to you in your life of faith. Again, you're welcome to speak them silently or aloud as we pray together. it is surrounded 
by those that we have named, by such a great cloud of witnesses, that with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we get to praise God's unending name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God. We'll be doing song responses this morning. Carol will, will lead us through them. Sorry about that. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples that he was having supper with, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, and he gave it to all of them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. It's my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we too offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving in union with Christ's offering for us as together we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. I invite you to open your hands in a posture of receiving as we continue to pray together. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with all your saints, especially those whom we have named before you. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, strengthen us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, pioneer and perfecter of our faith. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at last at your heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. invite us to join together in the prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as the communion servers and the choir come forward to prepare for communion, a couple notes of instruction, particularly if you are new to having communion with us, and then when you are invited to come forward, the ushers will come around to your seats. You are welcome to follow at their direction to the nearest communion station. And when you come, they will rip off a piece of bread and offer it to you with the words, this is the body of Christ given for you. You're welcome to dip that bread into the cup at the next station, uh, a cup of grape juice and receive both elements at the same time. 
As you come forward, if you need either gluten-free or prepackaged communion, all of us that are serving bread will have it in a basket on our arm. So just feel free to point to the basket or let us know you need either gluten-free or prepackaged. And if you need to see an ingredient card for gluten-free, then Lisa is in the back with the gluten-free station and the card there. You're welcome to see the ingredients. And if you, when the ushers come around, would like to receive communion at your seat, just let them know and we would be more than happy to be able to serve you there. Friends, this is a table where all are welcome. It is the table of our Lord who is a gracious host. There is nothing that can or should preclude us from feeling welcome at this table. Whatever shame or guilt we might be carrying, know that at this table, our God sees us and our God is not going anywhere. So you can come knowing that you are freely and joyfully welcomed around this table. Let us come and feast together.
Friends, the same words that led us into worship will be the words that will benedict us out. So I invite you to join me in this responsive benediction. May the love of God enfold us. May the grace of God uphold us. May the power of God set us free to love and serve all God's people. Now to God, who by the means of power working within us is able to do so much more than we can ask or even think of. To God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all times, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, go in peace, and we'll see you next week.